Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, yes, uh, this is joint work with my supervisor, Chava Sepeshwari, at the uh, University of Alberta. Today, I'll talk about factory linear models in reinforcement learning. So, just to get a quick show of hands, who is familiar with uh, the standard RL problem in MDPs? Good. Right, so, uh, yeah, our goal is to find uh, a policy to try to maximize the long term future reward that we collect in this. Uh, MDP where we observe some states, the agent takes an action, changes the state of the environment and observes a new state and uh, some reward signal. And one way to try to do that is through model-based reinforcement learning where we go through the cycle of uh, getting some data from the world, constructing a model, uh, cons constructing a policy from the model and then deploying it in the real world and maybe repeating that over and over. Um, and here, uh, today I'm going to talk about this planning step. What does planning mean? It means computing a policy from a model has be, that has been handed over to us. And traditionally, people have sort of uh, said, okay, this is it's too hard. Uh, trying to get a model of the world is too complicated because there's too many details. Uh, so we want to be able to, to, const to uh, treat models that are flexible, but have some underlying simplicity that we can take advantage of to do this computation step efficiently. And evidently, we also want to have guarantees uh, for the quality of this policy. Uh, we want to make sure that it's going to uh, indeed uh, maximize this long-term uh, future reward. All right, so uh, we know from Bellman's theory that uh, we can quite concisely express the best that we can do in terms of collecting rewards. So and uh, this is the optimal value function. Uh, it is the, the highest amount of reward that any po that you could collect with any policy. And we can write it as uh, simply the immediate reward plus some expectation over the next states of the optimal values of whatever you would get in the future. And if you notice here, we are in a discounted, uh, expected total discounted reward setting. So I want to write this concisely. It will uh, be useful for us to discuss these things in terms of operators. So I'll define these, uh, this operator TP, which simply takes the immediate reward and adds the expected value um, of the next state. So P is just this uh, linear transition probability kernel of our MDP. Is everything clear so far? Okay. Uh, and what remains to be defined, here, so this is essentially what is inside the max here, right? So the, the P is just taking this expectation for each uh, state and action. Uh, we take the expected value of the next state, and and now the the, the output of p uh, p is taking as input uh, some uh, state values and giving us uh, state action values. So to convert them back to state values, we're going to use this max operator that just takes the max over the actions or the columns for each of the states or uh, rows of this matrix. Here I'm pretending everything is finite dimensional, but uh, things go through in infinite dimensional spaces. And we can also define this greedy operator um, that will just give us the indices of the maximizing actions. All right, so we have this compact formulation and uh, this uh, the optimal value function is just a fixed point of this MTP operator. And we can get an optimal policy by taking this uh, greedy instead of uh, the max. And so we could just uh, maybe be happy that we can solve the MDP with Bellman's equation and uh, find the optimal policy. But uh, one thing is that we don't have access to P, and if, and if we did, this is often intractable uh, or very hard. So what we're going to do is just approximate P with this uh, factor linear model. And R is just co uh, will compress the value functions into uh, some uh, low dimensional space, and Q will reconstruct uh, these values. And the form for Q is that it will be this uh, tall and thin matrix. And uh, there are different choices we could make for R. One that we'll work with is simply is going to uh, <coughs> subsample this uh, long val uh, vector value, uh, value of uh, this long value function at uh, some predetermined set of states. And uh, the, the idea is to take advantage of uh, some underlying simplicity of P in this factor representation, but we also want to. Uh, allow efficient planning with this factor linear model. So as I said, if we had P, we'd uh, solve the uh, Bellman optimality equation, take the greedy policy, 
<coughs> we don't have P, so just, just replace with QR and uh, try to do this pretty much the same thing. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't even know if this fixed point exists, but let's go with it for now. Um, and the question is, can we find this fixed point? And even if it exists, we want to do it reliably. So, and we can do it if R is uh, this join homomorphism. It's basically uh, meaning it's not much different from the subsampling operator that I described uh, before. But the essential property is that we can commute it with the max, meaning that if you take this, um, it doesn't matter if you first take the max over the state action values and then compress the result, or if you compress each of the state action values and then take the max on the, on the compressed uh, result. So we can commute uh, at, uh, these, these operators, and our prime will simply compress uh, over the each of the uh, columns, and then we'll take the maximum in the low dimensional space. And we could try to find u star by applying this MTQ operator um, an infinite number of times from some initial guess u0. Um, I'm sort of sweeping under the rug whether we can do that, but let's try. Uh, we expand some definitions, realize that R and M occur together, swap things around, and now we can compress our rewards and compress the outputs of Q. So um, this is essentially a low dimension operator, and we can just apply it to a compressed initial guess. And this is uh, fairly, uh, this is easy to compute. And then at the very end, we just reconstruct and take the greedy. And this is what uh, we propose to do. So we find the fixed point of this low dimension operator and take the greedy policy. And for you to be able to do this, uh, we're going to impose this uh, non expansion constraint on R prime Q, which doesn't necessarily imply that uh, QR is also a non expansion. And to compute this um, this policy, all we need to do is some small amount of computation every time we want to query it, just in a product between two low dimensional vectors at a scalar and take the max over actions. And so this is efficient. And two questions that remain are whether uh, MTQR is a contraction and uh, not really in general. And does U star exist? Yes. You just replace G with M, you get uh, capital U star. Uh, we might not really care about U star except uh, from the theory point of view because it's useful to get uh, policy error bounds. And what is the policy error? It's simply the, the difference between the best you can do in terms of collecting reward, which is the optimal value function, and uh, the value of this pi hat policy that uh, we computed. And of course, the difference is vector value, so we have to choose some norm to turn this into a number that we're going to care about. And People have used, uh, most the actually, it's very easy to get uh, bounds in, in some specific settings with uh, the supremum norm, uh, but it's too harsh. So we're going to use other norms. And one way to, uh, one altern good alternative is the weighted uh, supremum norm, which allows us to consider uh, errors at different regions of the space with different uh, importance in quotation marks. And so we're going to take new to be this weight function for the high dimensional. Uh, norm on the high dimensional space. Eta will be the, the weight function for the norm on the low dimensional space. And our choice of norm here will determine this non-expansion constraint that we will we'll impose. And our theorem will be, uh, we have more or less this form. So the policy error in this norm is bounded by some combination of two types of error terms. This a priori error term in terms of v star and uh, v pi hat, and an a posteriori term that depends on uh, u star. So before I actually show these error terms, let me just describe uh, what will show up. Uh, first, the first error term is this um, reconstruction error. Uh, so essentially, it says that for v star, v pi hat, or u star, you should be able to push it through your model and get roughly the same result as if you had taken the expected uh, values of next states. And if you notice, it's quite different from requiring that the model be good point-wise uh, or be close point-wise to P. And I'm also hiding here norm over the, the actions. So for the weighted supremal norm, we'll simply take the maximum error over for each action over, uh, for, sorry, over the actions for each state. The next error term that shows up is similar to the previous one. Uh, just take the, this reconstruction and then uh, compress it down to the low dimensional space. Uh, it's very similar. And this is the bound that we have. So uh, the a priori terms are the ones that um, depend on v, uh, v star and v pi hat, as I mentioned before. 
and we have the high dimension reconstruction area the low dimension reconstruction divided by one over one, uh, sorry divided by one minus gamma which is uh, usually the term that tends to be uh, bigger in the bound and uh, we're kind of happy with this compression here this normally uh, might be easier to control um, at least we hope and we have also this uh, the norm of Q emerging here and if you remember this this norm depends on the input and output spaces of Q so uh, this is the low dimension the high dimension space so at the end of the day uh, we can actually plug in any norms that you want uh, for these results and what we get affected will be the norm of Q and that non-expansion assumption that uh, I already stated and, it, and it's nice that this result as I mentioned recovers uh, it, it being a, a weighted infinity norm result it generalizes the previous um, infinite norm results that we had for the policy error and just to give a very quick uh, gist of the proof here so we need this that V and U will be fixed point of these uh, composite operators where they differ on the second part and for simplicity I'm just taking that they're linear here um, the other important part is this assumption that uh, T2 is a contraction this is just to make uh, quantities disappear in the bounds here but uh, it's not necessary and we just use some fixed point identities, apply some triangle inequalities, and do get the old, uh, the old trick of moving things around in something like 1 over 1 minus gamma times uh, some model error. Nothing special here. Uh, the second part of the proof, instead of having a contraction for T2, we assume that T prime 2, T1 is a contraction. It's kind of like assuming that the, the low dimension operator will be a contraction. And we do the same thing, except that now, uh, there's no gain in pulling this uh, T prime 2 out and moving things around because you cannot get any uh, upper bound. So, well, instead of using one triangle inequality, why not use two triangle inequalities? So just go to the next one, do the same thing, uh, move some things around, then we get something like gamma over one minus gamma times another uh, model error. But this is the essence of the proof. It, it's, uh, it's not anything uh, really otherworldly, the rest of the details are just dealing with uh, the non-linearity of, uh, sorry, the, the, the need to have MB a non-expansion. And this somewhat constrains the, the choice of norm that we had. And uh, the, the, the assumption that I made about uh, this assumption is just emerges as the norm of Q in the bound. Uh, the other one, the second assumption that I stated is simply the real, uh, it's sufficient to take this non-expansion assumption. And the last one, assuming that T2 is a contraction, um, is slightly more complicated. You need to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, it depends on how P and the norm will interact. So as an example, we know that in supremum norm, uh, this, uh, the Bellman operator will, will be a contraction. But once you do, for example, LP norms, uh, you, you might have to fix the, to choose a, distribu a, spe a specific distribution, which is what we do in uh, some uh, the weighted LP norm result that we have. So we can fix mu to be, mu is going to be the weight distribution for the, the norm on the high dimensional space. And you can choose uh, whatever you want. For example, initial state distribution. Uh, psi will be stationary with respect to pi hat. And again, we're going to impose a constraint on the weighted supremal norm. It seemed uh, more sensible than taking the the constraint on a, a weighted LP norm on the low dimension space, for example. And we get uh, more or less the same thing as we had uh, in the other result, except that here we don't have an a posteriori term as an alternative to to epsilon 1 V star. Uh, this epsilon 1 looks, uh, it's pretty much the same as before with different norms. And this epsilon 2 terms now is going to have uh, been terms of uh, th this LP norm weighted by the stationary by a stationary distribution with respect to pi hat and we have this sort of concentrability coefficient going on here and a good thing about this bound is that uh, even if uh, the C is unbounded we, our bound is, is not vacuous so we, uh, yeah. and just to conclude um, so I presented these factor linear models uh, they actually generalize a, a number of uh, works in model based reinforcement learning and we're pretty excited that we're, we're able to um, understand more about a, a large class of uh, approaches. And they lend, uh, they're very useful for, for getting 
uh, efficient planning. So you're, we're able to, to, to do a small amount of computation here and to get a policy that with some extra amount of computation, um, every, every time you query it, you can get, uh, you can get a, a meaningfully good policy. And um, so we do efficient planning and then we have these performance guarantees that are presented that are in different norms. Um, so the, the assumptions are also relaxed. Normal people would assume that uh, you have uh, stochastic factors or, or operators. There are really contractions in the whole space. And here we don't. We just uh, take this constraint that is um, a constraint that you effectively you can just plug in into your convex minimization when you're building the model and you're happy with it and you get the guarantees. Um, we also have these uh, some tightness results for our bounds. Uh, we characterize linear joint homo uh, homomorphisms. You cannot really get too far from uh, sampling, subsampling points. We have some additional results for linear R. And again, this constraint is really practical. So it really um, could be ve it's very useful for, um, for the model building step. And we want to improve the model learning step as future work. I didn't talk about uh, this at all, but. Uh, the whole point of trying to make this efficient is to try to, to have some methods that are can be um, successful in practice. And I want to make different choices of M as well. So this constraint, the, the way we had to define these norms, especially when it came to uh, how to define a sort of induced norm over the space of uh, states and actions rather than just uh, values for the states. So maybe we could try a softmax action selector. And we should consider the average reward case as well. Uh, in particular, perhaps uh, as, a, as a hint, the, the key thing is to understand the scaling of U star uh, and how it affects the average reward case. Thank you. <laughs>